Okay, guys, I have to tell you, raise, like, make some noise if you made an ICU care package before you came in. Wow. So that was uh, Mama. Tell everybody, say hi. Say, give. This is my mom. She founded ICU Foundation. And um, on our first call about this event, Adam, my partner in all of the things, this is Adam, he uh, pitched, he pitched an idea that um, everyone would have to make a care package before coming in to the event to set an intention of being of service. So thanks, Adam, for your brains. Thanks, Mama, for coming here and guiding all of us in these jigsaw puzzle ways. Because as you all have experienced, it's not the easiest thing to do to put together these care packages. And thank you, Lauren and Olivia and the rest of the on team. We're so happy to be here. Okay, so I am going to... Um, before we introduce our incredible panelists and get into the conversation today, I'm just gonna ask everybody, um, raise your hand if you've had like a really intense, heavy last few weeks. Keep your hand up if you've like had really hard conversations you never thought you'd have to have. Yeah. Okay, cool, so same. So I'm gonna ask everyone to like just close our eyes for a minute and we're just gonna do some breathing so that we can get into our body because like, we are so, 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 so lucky and so blessed to be here. We're so blessed to be alive. Um, so I'm gonna just do like three breaths, four inhale count, four hold, four exhale. You can make all the noise that you want. And just like, just come into your body, be here, cause you're here right now. So, all right, it's gonna be four, inhale, two, three. Four, hold, two, three, exhale, in, hold, exhale, one more, hold, and exhale. Wow. I needed that so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know for, for many of us here, we have seen, we have witnessed, we have been eyewitnesses to some really horrifying things. Um, and my heart is with people and civilians in Palestine right now who are going through it. So my intention for tonight is that as we talk about democratizing movement, we are also honoring um, and, and sending love to people who are not able to actually move, whether it be in their own physical bodies, whether it be in their own spaces and where they're living, whether it be because um, they simply in themselves haven't been able to like you know, be embodied enough to to do the movement that is required of them or that their body is yearning for, which is why I'm so honored to be speaking to all three of you today because each of you have have actually in your own right broken barriers to movement. So I'm gonna kick off some introductions. Our first one is Gabby Alcala, who is an Aztec, mixed tech, indigenous woman from Oaxaca, who immigrated to the United States at age 19. She started her running journey 10 years ago. And in that time, she met an amazing coach who believed in her potential as a long distance runner. She has since been pushing the limits of her body, including participating in the Speed Project with a team of six women, as well as a 340 mile prayer run, which I'm very excited to ask her about, with the indigenous people in Utah. She has run 50 mile races, several marathons, half marathons, and 5Ks. And Gabby is an athlete advocating at Rising Hearts, which is a running collective focused on social change. She is also a mother and a neuromuscular therapist who understands all the struggles the body goes through in long distance running. Gabby. We have Sen Van Beek, all the way from Amsterdam. 
Sen is the founder of We Are Queer, a gym in Amsterdam. And as a non-binary person, Sen has experienced a lot of stress in the gym, despite sports being the thing that boosted their confidence. Sen wanted to fill a need for transgender and queer people who deal with the struggle and anxiety of exercising in group settings. And Sen's dream is to create a safe place for the LGBTQIA plus community to exercise any way they want in the comfort of their own space and bodies. Sen. Derek Drescher, you may have seen his face as you walked into the store today. He is a services specialist for Back on My Feet, a nonprofit that uses running as a catalyst for people who are displaced or unhoused. Derek himself has battled with homelessness and addiction, and it was running that became his tool to sobriety. So one of the things that Derek said to me that like has been blowing my mind was that he actually ran his first marathon less than a year after his last overdose. Am I correct in saying that? Right around that time. So this super, yes, thank you, thank you. I actually wanted to also kick us off because like, I feel like with addiction, it's like one of those things that, raise your hand if you know somebody or you yourself or you've just encountered at all anyone who has struggled with addiction in your life. That's like an overwhelming majority of this room. And yet, and yet, it is not something that is talked about as often in, in like group settings. Do you, do you find that to be true? Uh, yeah. And also, uh, you know, uh, so many people struggle with addiction. And I just think that the way it's looked at and how you might get treated if you ask for help keeps people from not talking about it. Ooh, yeah. accountability. On all of us. Yeah, so then you just fall apart until everybody knows anyway, so. Well, okay, so I want to get to that. First, I'm going to ask you, how's your heart doing today, Derek? My heart? My, your heart. Like physically or emotionally? However like, you feel inclined to answer that. I, the question I, is coming to you guys, too. I feel, I feel good. I feel good. Yeah? Yes. In your body? My body, yeah. Body, mind, yeah. I'm happy to be here. Beautiful. Yeah. Gabby, how's your heart doing today? Do you not have a mic? Do we not have two other mics? Oh, I got to pass the mic here. Yes, um, my heart is full of gratitude for the opportunity to be here um, sharing our stories and in a different city, not my city. And I'm sorry if I get like, emotional. I'm very a cry baby. <laughs> so you can say that my heart is very soft. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's it's amazing to uh, to be invited for for such a thing to share your story. So I think my heart is very full of love and excitement to um, to talk to you all. Thank you all so much. Do we have mics for you? Okay. So Derek, yes. I would love for you to kick us off. Can you tell me tell us the story? about the run that changed everything for you? Uh, there's two. There's two that stick out to me. The, the first run I had, so just so people have a little context, I uh, was a horrible uh, heroin addict. Uh, had like a four bundle a day habit at one point. And a lot of heroin. And uh, I ended up with nothing. I had overdosed quite a few times. The second time they brought me back to life, they, you know, they had to give me two shots of Suboxone. Um, if it wasn't for my brother, was the one who dragged me into the ER room. But um, I, the nurse came to me after, after they, uh, after they got me stable and I could like talk. And she told me, she's like, "You're the only one that we saved this week." Whoa. Yeah, and uh, I did use again after that, but it wasn't with like the same ferociousness. And uh, I basically ended up in this program on 43rd and 8th. And uh, through there is where I got introduced to Back on My Feet, which is uh, that nonprofit organization that I, I now work for. And he was running as a catalyst, you know, to help you get back on your feet. And uh, my first run, 
you know, you got to realize I'm going, you know, I had like a pause, which is post-acute withdrawal. I wasn't sleeping well. I was on a bunch of medication. I'd gained a ton of weight. And uh, that first mile, they call it the miracle mile, took me about 14 minutes. And then within a year of that time, I had run my first marathon in under four hours. And that's it was amazing. it was mild. Guys, that's amazing. Yeah. I also want to say that's the best marathon I've ever ran ever. <laughs> in my life. Never came close ever again. <laughs> so uh, mile 25 of my, f of the, my first New York City marathon, uh, I remember I didn't have like a nice watch at the time. I just had like a regular digital and I was looking at the watch and I saw the 25 mile marker and I was like, I was like, I don't think I'm going to make it in under four. I don't think I'm going to do it. And then I was like, you've worked so hard to get where you are. You know, you're, you're not using drugs. Like your family's back in your life. You, you made every mile of this, of the training. Like you, you did it all. And I started to cry as I was running and I was like, no, no, chill, chill. You need this. <laughs> I was like, you need, you need this for, you know, for this last, you know, push you're going to do. And then, yeah, I ended up three hours, 58 minutes and 46 seconds. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Gabby, what is, tell us the story about the run that changed your life. I, I mean, every single run is a special because it has a different meaning. It depends on how emotional, emotionally or spiritually you are. But the first one that, um, that actually changed how I see running is when I ran my first marathon in 2017. Uh, in our culture, uh, accordingly to the Aztec calendar, we follow the trecenas, the 20s. So, uh, it was 20 years that I was living in the States. Um, and that was a prayer run for what it is life. In that moment, we were um, advocating for what it is life uh, with the North Dakota people. So I want to be grateful for the opportunity and following my traditions on the 20 years is when your life changed. And let me tell you that your, my life has changed so much. So in 20 years, uh, I was giving thanks for the opportunity to live in Tonga land. I mean, Sele, and my community recognized me uh, for the work that I do in the indigenous community with the feather. So that day we have uh, New Year's, Aztec New Year's, and my community recognized me because I was about to run my first marathon. And uh, elders from the indigenous community in LA, they talked to me, and they guide me, and the Tonga people, like, give me the blessings. Um, because we were doing it the right way. So I under, uh, in that moment, I understand the importance of asking permission to live where we live and connect with indigenous people where we are, and also uh, bringing my own traditions and combining them, because at the end, it's everything about the land, the community, and the people. And that was a super beautiful experience and I can say that that changed my life, my the way that I see life because I was having the purpose, not just for me in the moment of running because I was celebrating 20 years in the States, but also I was praying running for what it is life and the people that was in the, in the front stand and for the people that deserve clean water. Because water, people would think the money is the goal. Water is goal. And water is what gives us life. So that's. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. The run that changed everything. Well, I don't run. <laughs> the, <laughs> the workout that changed everything. <laughs> um, I think so. I used to, before opening uh, my gym I was uh, in and before COVID uh, I was in um, training for a competition in two strongmen um, 
which is basically lifting really heavy stuff and strange objects. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's no other way around it. But um, it's, um, yeah, I was training in order to compete and I was like through the first round. So I was able to attend the competition and then COVID hit and everything got canceled. Um, so it's actually not like I've never actually competed. Um, but then like as a non-binary person, um, doing a sport called strongman is kind of binary. Um, so that's also something that I'm now, uh, looking into, uh, and I'm back on my training schedule. Uh, so hopefully next year or a year after I'll do my first competition. But what, that's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Tell me about the the moment that you realized you wanted to open this gym? Oh, um, yeah. So figuring out your whole gender identity and just really um, trying to listen for to your body. Like for me, it really was like, I sometimes say like I was like locked up in my body from like age of like 12 to like 27. That's when I figured out what non-binary was and like that, that, actually fitted me um so being locked up in your body for such a long time but feeling the need to like work out and like attend like sport places and stuff like that but never really feeling like you fit it in because it was always like I was never one of the guys and I was always never one of the girls so I also never knew like who I was like belonging to or wanting to meet up with um and back then I was, uh, so I was active in the queer community. So I did like meet up with people from the queer community. Um, but there was always something that really like stopped me from enjoying sports. And then I came out as non-binary, started living my life, starting to figure out who I was and starting to more and more notice that I wanted to work out. I wanted to be in a gym. I wanted to build on my body. I wanted to feel like strong and like everything that I always felt from within. Um, but yeah, still had the problem. There was uh, coaches not understanding what I was saying. So coaches thought like, oh, oh, you want to lose weight or you want to like gain weight or you like you want to like achieve like certain numbers to be able to lift or stuff like that. And that was all not what I was saying because it was all with my gender dysphoria that um, they didn't understand. And also back then I didn't know how to like tell someone that didn't experience the same things. So you filled a need. Yes. And then I thought like, well, I'm a strong person. I can get shit done. Like, <laughs> <laughs> why not start a degree in personal training, figuring out if I like this stuff and build a gym myself. So oh. we started a campaign called Build That Gym. Wow. And um, did a crowdfunding. And then six months later, we opened up. That's incredible. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Derek. Yes. How'd you do it, man? How? Yeah. Like um, how? Like what was the self-talk? Like what were the conversations you had with yourself? Was community a factor in yeah, it? Yeah. Community was yeah. a big part of it. Tell me more. Uh, so the, the program, right back on my feet, partners with the program that, you know, I'm, I'm living in, right? So it's like I'm getting uh, two... I'm getting like double treatment, you know what I mean? Because now I'm part of this running team and then I'm also like working on my substance abuse issues inside of the program. But I only joined because they were giving everybody sneakers. <laughs> and I didn't have anything. So I was like, I'm gonna join, I'm gonna get some, I'm gonna get some Nikes. And uh, it, uh, it, it didn't really, I was so aloof, I, had, I was so detached, I had no idea like what was happening in the world around me. Like the, uh, there's volunteers that come out and run with us in the morning and I thought that these people like worked for the organization 
And then when I found out that they were volunteers, I was like, what is wrong with you people? Why, why are you waking up at 4.30 in the morning to come hang out with me? This is ridiculous. I, and, you know, they hug a lot. <laughs> and in the beginning, I was like, oh, don't touch me. All right, nobody, just leave me alone. But um, they, they, and then they would talk to you on the run, the volunteers, the whole time. They're like, oh, tell me what's going on. This and, that. and I'd be like, yo, lady, shut up. I'm, I'm going to die. Like, I can't. <laughs> I can't breathe. And then eventually what happens is, you know, they're asking you about your day. They don't care about, you know, what you did in your past. They just want to assist you with getting to where you're going. And then I wanted to give everybody a hug. And I was asking everybody how their day was. And it just, you know, if it was brainwashing, it was the good kind. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thanks yeah, I wouldn't that. be I wouldn't be where I am without those people for sure. Like at what point in that journey did you realize that sobriety was like kind of the move for you? Well, I I knew I had like um even though I knew I was sober at that time and clean, you never know, especially with heroin it's very tough uh, or opiates in general, it's like this thing that's always hanging over you. Because I tried to get clean before, I'd get like 30 days, 60 days, and I would relapse. And uh, you want you want to know when I knew it was the move? Yeah, I want to know. All right, this has nothing to do with running. Great. But I was walking down 8th Avenue. Like, you get passes after you've been clean for a little bit. They let you go, you know, buy stuff, candy, cigarettes. And I was walking down 8th Avenue. It was 2014? I think and I was wearing a, a Sean Jean velour suit <laughs> and nobody else was wearing one. And then I was looking at the billboards and I was like, who the f are these people? And then I was like, oh, the world is passing me by wow. and I need to, the world's not going to change for me. I need to change for the world. And that was, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's like something I've really, really, really realized in the last, I mean, I've been realizing it a lot, but I feel like in the last couple of weeks, it's been more clear that like, we cannot change people. We cannot impose ourselves onto people. We cannot change the world. Like the actual thing of changing the world is changing yourself. Like that is because when you change yourself, you are in like inevitably changing your actual reality or changing your actual world. And then you get to design the world that you want to live in. And I'm so happy to hear that you like, poof, you got that yeah. and you're here. Yep. And now you're the face of this store. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Thank you. Gabby, the prayer run. Can you just like guide us through what is what a prayer run is? Because I remember even like when we had our first conversation, just hearing you talk about running, I was like, this is very much a spiritual act. Like it's like you, you engage in running as like your feet and your body connecting with the very earth that you're touching in every movement. What is a prayer run and why is running so spiritual for you? Um, prayer run is a ceremony. Um, it's, like, it's the same you know, when you go to church or uh, wherever the space that you are, that you believe and pray for someone else. Uh, running for me, it's an offering for the people that can move. Um, like three weeks ago, I just ran Toronto in a prayer run. And, um, and I ran it on my leg. It was the first time I actually... Um, let people know the reason that I was running. That was a prayer run for peace. And it was heavy in certain parts. Let me tell you, because um, I was thinking of the people that didn't wake up the morning. Um, the mothers. The kids. Or whoever lose someone that, the morning. And I was there, being able to run, sharing a space with thousands of people in a different city. Because I'm from Mexico, so I'm an immigrant. And I've been living in the States for the, for the past 26 years. Um, so that's why running is ceremonial. 
running his prayer, running his connectedness to ourselves and also to the land. Because in the land that we stay, sometimes there's people that has been giving their life for us. Like when I was in Toronto, I don't know, these flashbacks were coming, like especially because for what is happening the other side of the world, but also the people that were in this, the land that I was running, like all these flashbacks were coming and I said, oh my gosh, what a privilege because these people give their life so I can be able to run in this land and this connectedness. So that's why it's so important for us to run in prayer because um, in the prayers that I've been doing, it's uh, for missing indigenous women, the land back. Um, so many resources like for the water, for the air. Um, it's more the offering that I can give, um, just putting that little grain of sand in the universe, because we, as you say, we are ripples or effect. So other people can learn how to connect with themselves and they can do it. But also is to be full on yourself so you can give that. Because otherwise, what are you giving? So um, connecting with the land, connecting with the universe. And one of my sisters, uh, indigenous sisters, she shared with me, like, I'm grateful that they create, that your ancestors carry you through the whole 26.2 miles. <laughs> that point two are the fathers. <laughs> Forget about the 26. <laughs> it's always those point two um, last uh, steps. So that I was able to move my body because people like people that are in drugs, they can do that. But if I can keep offer like a mile just for the people that are in this world, in this hell, in this minor state that they can move from that space, that's um a gratitude from my heart. And if it is for someone that has missed their daughter or their mother, because whatever was happening in the, in the indigenous communities, but it's not only in the indigenous communities, it's also like people that they can live their truth or who they feel identify. That for me, it's a gratitude that I can able to move for those that I, that I can move. Thank you so much for sharing that. There's, um, how many of you are familiar with the book Braiding Sweetgrass? Handful of you. Yeah. Okay. So Robin Wall Kimmerer, she is um, a beautiful indigenous author and botanist. And uh, I listened to the audio book because it's just so stunning. But one of the things that she says about ceremony is that we engage in ceremony to remember what we remember. And I think a lot about like this concept of remembering and how like everything that all of the answers that we're looking for, everything that like we're seeking external validation, seeking external guidance, like all of those, all of it exists inside of you. If you are willing to like ground and listen and remember what you remember. And I think running as a ceremony is such a powerful act because it requires you to be mindful of your actual like mind, body, soul. Like you have to be, otherwise you'll get injured or otherwise you'll get injured. Really, that's all I'm scared of. <laughs> I don't run, but I'm very, like I admire all of the people who are and it, it's been so inspiring. Thank you for sharing that because I think that like, I, I think people have different ways of prayer and different ways of ceremony, but like it's all about really, I feel like for me, getting back into our bodies and being here now. Like, you know, so many of us are so glued to our screens. My screen time is up by like a jazillion percent right now. And it's, it, I don't know. It's like, uh, sometimes you just have to like pull yourself out of it and remember like what's right here. And I would love to know Sen, like, what does it mean for you to be in your body? Um, to be in my body means, yeah, just to, to, to be me. Like to be valued and seen and acknowledged uh, as the person that I am and not needing to 
fit in to someone else's standard or in fit in into the um, guidelines that we were brought up with but to really just know that I can just be me and that that's okay and I think that's um, like you mentioned earlier like hey um, like we can't change the world and you can't demand the world to change I, I feel as a non-binary person I feel a bit different about that because well, I'm not going to talk to you if you don't respect my pronouns. Like, and like that, of course, is still me cho like choosing to um, to change myself and to try to let that change be seen by others so that they can change themselves as well. Um, but I think it's as a as like we non-binary people need to also stick up and like say like, hey, you know, like we're here and like you need to change because otherwise you're not going to be inclusive towards everyone and you're gonna so i like f yeah I, I still I, think that you're like leading in that though like you're saying you're setting your boundaries for like how you engage with the world yeah i yeah. think it's powerful yeah yeah i i just partly won the uh, lawsuit against the dutch state uh, about no that way topic. yeah Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to change my legal documents and my legal name. Um, and we don't have the X option in the Netherlands uh, yet in a way that is uh, achievable for everyone. Uh, but also if you do have the X, um, you can't get married. You can't uh, get children because you, that those are things that are in the law designed for men or women. Um, and I wanted to change my name and I wanted to change my passport because that is the option that you can do, but then the rest isn't arranged. So I took a lawyer and I went to court to the Dutch state and I just said like, well, you know, like, I think that's a bit, um, in conflict with the laws that we do have, which say that we, um, that non-binary people are seen and acknowledged so like why isn't the law book then according to that so yeah congrats thank you <laughs> you sued the state yes. okay i want to open it up to the community in the room right now and just is that we am from did you come from canada oh my gosh it's so great to see you um so I wanted, uh, because Sen brought it up about like this whole idea of like changing the world and changing yourself to change the world. I want to know if any of you have feelings about that. Like what, how are you redefining for yourself what it means to embody? I should, I should clarify. Okay. A question I'm asking myself a lot lately is how do I personally embody the world that I want to live in? How do I like work on myself so much and so constant that everything that I like, for example, if I'm seeing so much division in the world, but I want to see unity, then like, how do I look into my own heart and see the cracks of division and see the cracks of judgment and see the cracks of hatred and be like, need to work on that, need to work on that, need to work on that. Because like, that feels like the only option to me at this point. So I'd love to know if any of you have any questions that you've been asking yourselves or like ways that you've been thinking about like showing up differently in the world. Yeah, Gabby, kick us off, please. And then somebody raise your hand. So in our traditions, uh, we say that we, we're like the hands, um, the fingers on our, our hand were different. But if we come together, we're powerful. So that's why this, um, where we do this hands on, that it doesn't matter the race, it doesn't matter who you are, as long as you become a human and you can connect with human to human and you know that love is the only one, the only medicine that can save us, we are together. It doesn't matter what race you are, it doesn't matter what political party you are, as long as you choose human and as long as you choose love, that one matters. So that's why we always do this. Thank you, Gabby. Dale, can we pass um, Derek's mic? He, Dale here. Dale, right. 
Yeah. First uh, ICU care package maker of the night. He kicked us off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you know, so when you mentioned even just struggles and things that you you battle with, um, so just a little context, uh, former NFL athlete, I've had every athletic ability in the world, um, but movement and a no the number one reason I came to this panel is uh, my sister has physical and intellectual disabilities. And at five years old, she had the flu and woke up the next day and could never walk again. Well. Um, you know, even thank you for sharing your story. Uh, my dad suffered with heroin addictions for an extremely long time. Um, but I think like when we talk about how to battle some of these struggles and this is what the health and wellness industry has done for me, I was always raised to be a servant leader. Um, and that might be lonely. That might not be the easiest Can thing to do. Can you define that for us? Um, I think of what can I do for others and I don't need nor want anything in return? Or what resources do I have that are a privilege to have that can help other people? Um, and I think when you take that perspective and when you talk about inclusivity and the movement um, and just the community, uh, it's, it's something that's extremely powerful. Um, and I would say, just going off that, because it just touched me, um, if you are struggling with something, like you don't have to take that weight and carry that by yourself. Mm. Like as human beings, we are meant to share that, you know, and that's why everyone's here today. So um, I think just overall, the smallest thing uh, can be so powerful. And uh, I mean, just like today, we kicked it off serving others. So thank you so much, Dale. Anybody else have any perspective they want to share on that? Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, first off, just want to give a shout out to everyone on the panel for coming here and sharing your story. Uh, shout out to Derek for wearing the Sean John velour suit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you rocked it. Gabby, if you were back here like I am listening, uh, nothing but sniffles and empathy uh, for your story. And Sean... Thank you again for sharing your story with us and living your truth. And that's, that's the, the hardest part. The hardest part is before I can connect with any and everybody else, I have to figure what is it that I am searching for. Uh, and to do that, I actually go for a run, <laughs> injury free. <laughs> um, and so to go for a run to allow me to clear my head so that I can better connect so whether that is through community, whether that is figuring out my tribe, but then it's going back to what Sean is saying and making sure that you're constantly living your truth. And that takes a lot of courage. So I think it's connecting, it's courage, and community. Thank you so much. Can we get your name again? Uh, Mori Elena. Mori Elena, that's right. Thank you, Mori Elena. Anybody else, or we'll get back to, yes, amazing, love well, it. Thank you, Sean, I'm with you. I don't like running, I like pushing things. <laughs> things are heavy, I like pushing them, that's just me. Um, but Let's get your name. Talik Norman. Talik, um, nice to meet you. But uh, just sitting back here listening, I just think about things that Boss Lady always constantly says about equity, and I think about the conversation. And my thought every day is, how do I change the conversation about movement or just anything in life? And each day I want to put a positive thing in changing that conversation around movement or anything in life. So how can I change the conversation in a positive way? That's just how I approach it each day. Well, thank you so much. I want to know more, though. Like, how do you approach that? Like, what are you asking people or how are you engaging in the conversation? Are you starting the conversation? So each day I'm just trying to get to know one thing new or try to share one thing that I've learned with each person that I come across. And if it's around movement or fitness or health and wellness, something that positive that helped me and gain something that positive helped me. Um, that way I can share with the next person. That's so amazing. And what is it for today? Today is just saying hello and giving out hugs. That's what I learned today. I loved hugging you earlier. Thank you so much. It's so great to hear from you. Anybody else? We love hearing from you so much. Let's get the mic back. 
So the intention of this conversation is about democratizing movement. But like, what is that? What does that mean to you, Derek? Hmm. Well, democracy is like government. But like making movement accessible, like breaking oh. barriers to movement, like so yeah. that everybody, like so that we can define a, define it differently for everyone. So, <laughs> I mean, my experience with it, you know, and this really opened my eyes to things, is um, when I started to run, the people who were on my team, you know, there was people who were like me, you know, homeless. Uh, substance abuse issues in and out of jail and then there was also people who were like scientists and lawyers and things like that and if you're looking at it from the outside at some you know it's like a couple different classes of people you know not everybody is the same but when we put that uniform on in the morning and we all circled up and stretched you couldn't tell who was who and uh it's just uh that the playing field became like level and uh i don't know that's that's what that means to me i would imagine in my experience no it's beautiful yeah that's amazing um thank you for sharing that i love that that neutrality of like it reminds me of i'm muslim so when there's like a when people engage in like the pilgrimage to Mecca, everybody has to like wear the exact same thing with the intention of like not knowing what someone's social class is or not knowing what someone's background. It's like everybody in this moment is the same and that's what matters. It's like human to human. Um, And as a human to human, I'm actually quite terrified of running. Like I think, like it actually, how many people run in this room? Oh my God, guys. Oh my God. Okay. So um, asking for a friend what do we do if we're terrified to run? And I would say my reasons for fear, or I mean, my friend, I mean, my friend's reasons for being afraid about running is like injury is like that sharp pain in your chest in that breathing. It's like my knees. I don't know. But I want to hear from somebody who like has gotten over that fear. No, I, I think it's literally one of the things that we do is for those that have that fear or those that are differently able, yeah. we start with walking. And it's one foot in front of the other. But again, it's harder growing up in New York. Uh, you know, we move at such a fast pace. Walking is our running. Right. So, wow. But I, I think it's just one foot after another. And then find a friend. You can walk and talk. You don't have to Usain Bolt or Allison Felix it. <laughs> just You just find your pace. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would love to know from you, Gabby, like, because running, you, you engage with it in such a sacred way. And you, you said you started running 10 years ago? Yes. So, like, what, what was the thing, the switch in your brain that was just like, oh, this is something I'm going to do with my body now? <laughs> well, first of all, I ran across the border 26 years ago. <laughs> No small feet. So tell us that story. When I said, tell me about a run that changed your life, I'm pretty sure that was the answer we were all looking for. Um, so wait, can you tell us about that? <laughs> well, you know, as an immigrant, <laughs> that you had to, that, well, in that moment, I was so ignorant. I didn't know that I had to get a visa to get to the States. And <laughs> my, my family lied to me. They say, oh, you know, just come to the to Tijuana, and I have my six months baby. Oh my yeah. gosh! So I I brought I came with her to Tijuana. I said, "Don't worry, you're gonna get cross." And they sent this lady that I didn't know, and she's like, "Oh, Mija, don't worry, just give it to her. Your daughter's gonna be here, but you need to go across the border." And I said, "What? How? Like, don't separate me with my daughter." Uh, so now let's say that my daughter has to to heal her abandonment. Uh, <laughs> that's I mean, where it starts. It's like a dark laugh, guys. Yeah. <laughs> we all have a little bit of abandonment issues at some point, okay? Yeah, that, that's, that's where her yeah, start. Yeah, that's hard. Because <laughs> she didn't see her mom for two weeks. Wow. Yeah. Two weeks? Two weeks. How did you, like, what? How did you do that? How did you know? Well, the person that went to, because this is another story. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> the person that my mom sent to, for me to Tijuana, uh, he said, oh, yes, I know how to cross people, but he didn't have papers either. <laughs> <laughs> We're allowed 
to laugh. She's laughing. <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to laugh because I mean now it's laughable, but in the moment I was like, what? I was so confused. So then he said, we had to go through this border. Have you seen the uh, Mexican border? So we had to jump that fence. Whoa. Once. And then we had to run through the, to the mountains. So in order for the... You were uh, running. High, running. 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 Wow. Do you, even, do you know how long you were running for? I don't know. Uh, the first time I remember uh, it was raining so hard that oh. we run... I don't know how many miles, and then we found ourselves like running around because it was run, it was raining, so it was muddy. So we just ended up in the end. <laughs> yes, at the end of the mountain, well, full of muddy. So I recall that I I was in San Diego. That's what I was told. So the the patrols find found us, but I was hiding so good that they found the other guy and the other guy was telling me like Gavi you need to come out and I said I don't want to get out but also in my mind I was like how am I gonna get to my family I don't know you were 19 right yes 19 years old yes wow so I had to come out and they take us back to to Mexico and he's like don't worry we're gonna try again and even and even the police told me oh don't worry in three hours you can try again Go ahead. So you ran again? So, yeah, it took us like another. So it took me three times. She tries to get to the state. So the second time, uh, we gathered with another group and we walk in the middle of uh, the mountains. There was these helicopters looking for immigrants. So I just sit down and start laughing and say, oh my gosh, <laughs> tag. <laughs> You're tag. <laughs> oh my gosh. So that was the second time. The third time, that's when I crossed the border. But that time, um, we got gathered with another person that was bringing four people. I was the only woman in the, in the group. We had to work the whole night. And we had to hive one day through the day in bushes. We couldn't even uh, whisper. We had to be quiet. So the second night, we had to wait without food, without uh, water. Um, the second night we had to wait and they said, no, we won't be able to cross tonight because they said that it was hot. That means there was a lot of patrols around. Um, so I had to wait for another day. Well, and that night we had to, from where we're hiding, I just remember that the guy says, you have five seconds to get across to this bridge. That was the disgusting water passing. I don't want to even say, share anymore. Yeah. Uh, and jump in a truck because that's when the police was um, doing this change. So we finally made it to to that um, to the truck, and I get to San Diego, and from there uh, they took me to um, LA until LA. My family was able to pay for my rescue. Let's say wow. So. I was able to be released. And this is the circle that I that I close up is um, four years ago, um, I took the decision to go uh, with this organization in San Diego that it's called the Borders Angels. They drop water in the desert. And let's say that I took water to the same mountain that I crossed 26 years wow. ago. It's been healing for me. But the first time, because it's, we have to leave a message in the water. Mm. Write something that you feel in your heart. So we made like the packages that you did. We, we leave food. We had to carry two gallons of water for almost seven miles up to the mountains or seven miles. And they have different spots. So when the people that cross the border, they can find this food. Wow. And just realizing that they actually, the people actually use those resources, it was fulfill, fulfillment for myself and also like healing, healing that part. You passed that, it on. I, yes. Wow. Yes. So An angel passing it on to another angel. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I would love to ask too, because... One of the things that you said to me when we talked before this was that 
you want people to know that, you know, when people think of indigenous people, they think that they are people who used to be on the land. But your your mission is for people to know, no, indigenous people are still here. Like we're seeing indigenous people constantly fight land back, even what we're seeing happening in Palestine. So as an indigenous woman, like making that journey to come here, if you are comfortable sharing, like what did making that journey mean to you? And what does it like and how do you reflect on that now? Well, um, back back then I have I, w- I was a single mother. I'm still a single mother, but with more kids. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, so back then I was 19 years old. Um, and they always talk, you know, back in our countries they always say, "Oh, the American dream." Yeah. They always talk about the American dream. Um, and I said, well, when I, when I had my daughter, I said, well, I'm 19 years old. What am I going to do? Um, so they say, oh, the American dream. And I said, why well, don't pursue the American dream? I want to give my daughter a better life, a better education. You thought that at, at 19? At 19. And I said, well, the only place that I hear that it's good to find um, those resources in the space was in the States. So I decided when I was pregnant to come to the States, uh, again, without knowing that I need a visa. Um, so I had to work so hard when I came to the States. I When I get here, because I didn't have the proper uh, papers, And community sometimes doesn't support you. So it all depends. So I remember the place where I get, um, these people told me, oh, don't get out of the house because immigration is going to come for you. But because I'm a rebel, I was like, oh, no, I need to leave. I need to work. So uh, the best that I do, I start cooking different plates and I started pushing so I was one of the vendors the street vendors I don't know if you've ever been in LA how you see in the street vendors so I was one of them and that's why I fight for them too um, so I was pushing my car with different plates of different uh, types of food and pulling my stroller with my six months baby yeah. um, that that was uh, a hard time but I made it and lim- and I can say and now I had the privilege to be in this panel. I had the privilege to run. And I have the privilege to say that, yes, I'm living the American dream. Not only me, but also my kids have a different, uh, different ways of living, way, way different than I had. Thank you. I'd love to open it up to if anybody has any questions for any of the panelists, and then we can kind of do some community mingling. We can wrap. Any questions? Any thoughts? Any confessions? Amazing. Yeah. You want to make one up? Do you wait? Um. Yeah. My name's Izzy. I'm uh, uh, with Connor here. We're from Portland, Oregon. And we're with a nonprofit supported by uh, on called uh, Go the Distance. We take people in drug and alcohol treatment centers running, and we do exactly what happened to you. So when you're sharing your story, I can be right there with you because we also do that. We go up, we give them hugs. Thanks to Lauren and the staff, you know, we, we provide them the shoes and we do the incentive, you know, because a lot of these guys, they don't want to run, you know, but they want the shoes. And so it gets them out of the treatment center and it begins the journey to create healthier um, choices, right? And then and then what we do is we encourage movement, not just, it's not just uh, running like very fast or anything, but it's just about getting started. It's about making a decision, right? And I think all of us have made a decision, right, to better our lives, you know, um, 
And I, I get such strength from hearing all of four of you, all of us, and I know there's many here in the audience too, because um, seven years ago, you know, I was injecting crystal meth into my body and, you know, I was where you were. And now I'm sitting here with these clothes on, and these new shoes, and I'm I'm having breakfast with the people here on the panel, and you know, and I have people like this amazing um, on supporting us. How the fuck did this happen? You know, it's just so it just blows. Excuse my language. It just blows my mind. And I I never understood. I think I think that some of it has to do with finding your authentic self, and in order to be successful what you're doing you have to be your authentic self because you cannot bullshit a bullshitter yeah you cannot do it and if and for me I'm gay and it took me so long to I'm even even right now that was hard to say you know uh, it's obvious to everybody else <laughs> but to me it's very difficult right I'm brown I'm Mexican I don't speak Spanish I'm gay it's been very hard I'm a drug addict in recovery, you know, and so finding my authentic self and being here with you all has opened my mind. I was a waiter all my life, and now that I'm embarking and going on to this journey with all of you and taking your strength and hearing your stories, I think sharing the stories like you did helps people like us, right, get to where you are because you guys are really amazing, and I think we're all amazing, and I'm grateful to be here. I don't What's your know. name? There wasn't really a question in there, but <laughs> I just like holding this mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I'll give that. it back now. Thank you. That was beautiful. Anyone else? Yeah. Let, let's pass. Please, please. No, no, no. We need. We need. You got to have a mic. We need it for the podcast. Give us your name too, please. Cool. Ooh, yo, what's up? I'm Adam from the On Team here. Uh, this question goes to all three of y'all. Uh, what is your North Star? So maybe in the short term, it's making a gym for non-binary people. But in you know, 10, 20 years, what's the, is there something that's driving each one of you guys in terms of big goals? Thank you, Adam, for giving us our closing question of the night. What a collaborative event. I feel like every single person here. Okay, Sen, what is your North Star? Ooh, um, well, I want to provide uh, safe spaces for the queer community throughout the Netherlands, so not only just Amsterdam, because, like, yeah, Amsterdam is already a safer space. Um, so definitely want to do that. And uh, I want to do more events. So we're a nonprofit as well. So I also want to do more events with um, minorities within the minority of being queer. Um, so we started doing um, events with refugees um, uh, where we provide them like a safe space to work out. Um, and I just want to... I want to explore that world of what we can do and uh, how we can, yeah, help even more people. Because sports is fun. Like, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> Stayed very quiet for we were people like, that Do we all sports. agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> no, sports is fun, you know, like, and, and, and you want people to enjoy that and not, not in ways to like achieve a certain goal so we say we celebrate each body and you don't come to our gym to lose weight or to get a six pack or and if that's truly what you want then of course we'll help but and we'll support but like no we just want you to be happy and to enjoy and to have a great time so like i think that's so it's basically what we do but then just on a larger scale and with way more people and for more people Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Before I answer the last question, I want to share with Noor <laughs> uh, that because you are afraid of running, do it. Dare yourself to do it. <laughs> That's how you're going to know what it's out in the other side of your fear. Do it. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> 
that's just running. No, that you can cry. I mean, I cry so, so many times when I'm running, especially when so I'm much processing, sleep, guys. <laughs> so yes, do it. Um, how I see myself is um, as long as I can move my body, it doesn't matter if the crazy girls running out there. Like, uh, like I'm 45 years old. And I'm so proud of my age because I've been living beautifully. And now I'm passing on to gener my other generation. Like my son is running track and, he, um, and we have a date. So Wednesdays, we go to our running group community in Boyle Heights Bridge Runners. Uh, and, he's, and that's our day, mom and daughter day. So we run together. And we've been running, and I was trying to get him for the 5K in New York so he can run, and I and he will be proud. But um, but the uh, the race is sold out, so I can't get him. <laughs> but that was like if anybody here can get a plug in. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, but I'm happy because we're passing this through generations. Like now, my son sees me and asks me questions like, "Mom, how?" How can I how can I do this? Um, I was asked two weeks ago to mentor to two people that are gonna run their first marathon in March. That's gonna be their LA marathon. So I'm happy and glad and honored to share what I learned all these years in the running community. Also, I've been give, given advices to to SRLA students. Uh, and body mechanics, like how can you run to run to pro, to prevent um, injuries? Uh, uh, how to look for shoes for running? Like what is the proper shoes for you? It depends on how your gait and everything. So I, as long as I can move, I will be running and praying and praying. And if one day I can do it, I'll be there supporting everyone that that will be moving their body. Thank you, Gabby. Derek, North Star. This is a deep question. Uh, I mean, besides like wanting to live in a house and like being very good at my craft and all that stuff, as a human being, uh, so I was incarcerated this one time, right? Well, of many times. This one time of many times. And uh, there was this guy I did not get along with at all. His name was Hassan, right? And uh, he said to me, like, I was, I was leaving in a couple of days. I was on short time. He was like, he was like, I need to speak with you. And I was like, oh, I, I thought we were going to fight. And uh, <laughs> he was just like, uh, he, because I had been reading and writing during that particular bit, but he was like, uh, Mr. Drescher, you're not the same uh, man that walked in here. You know, uh, it, you've changed. And I'll never forget any, and, and I looked at him, he just, and he goes, you changed. Do you know that? And I and then he goes, uh, I sincerely hope so. And uh, he, I started to walk away from him, and he goes, "Don't worry, you're gonna find your people." Whoa. And uh, if I can at least get that message out to people who are going through something similar to what I've went through, even if they hate me, you know, if they could just hear what I got to say, and then maybe never speak to me again, if they could find their people too, as a human, that would be my goal, I guess. But yeah. That's it. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. One moment. Please, Sam. Yeah. So within like the world today, like transgender people are having a really difficult time, uh, especially also within sports. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what to do or whatever, but I want to ask you if you can like take a moment this week, doesn't need to be today, but this week to look up who is fighting for the trans community and what you can do to support them. Um, because it's, it's, it's a difficult battle and it's, it's, the trans community is all over the world. So that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah? Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, every single one of you, for showing up for yourselves, for this community. Thank you, Adam, for that final question. Um, it's been so beautiful being here. I think we have like 
uh, sometime if people want to mingle and make a friend, because this is like a really, really solid group of people, guys. Like I know a lot of people here and they're all amazing. So thank you all so much. I'm Nur Tajuri at your service.